David Bierbach and I investigate collective behavior and collective intelligence here at Humboldt University. Yeah, at the moment we are at the Campus North in Mitte at uh, Humboldt University. We're here in the facilities of the uh, Department of Biology and Ecology of Fish. Here we investigate with the robofish collective behavior of fish swarms and we try to get the um, the rules and the mechanisms, how swarms, how groups really function uh, with that robofish. And then we hope to apply our knowledge also to other animals or even to humans or to uh, autonomously driving cars and drones. We see here our so-called robofish, which is uh, an artificial built fish that is aimed to interact with live fish. And uh, basically this robot consists of two units. The first unit is a fish-like uh, fish dummy, uh, a replica of a, of a live fish that we made by 3D printing and then we color it. We attach little glass eyes on that um, uh, dummy fish. And because we, we know or we, we found out that these glass eyes really attract the live fish, so they really accept this uh, kind of artificial fish as a conspecific. And the second uh, part is below this aquarium. It's a robot unit that is basically yeah, a small cart that we can steer with a wireless LAN. And so uh, both parts are coupled uh, with magnets. So at the foot of this little fish, there are two magnets and on top of the robot unit, there are also a magnet. So we can uh, steer and drag uh, this fish dummy through the tank and so really control it as we want and by having uh, several cameras filming uh, the whole setup we can um, give the robot the coordinates of the live fish and then let the robot interact with the live fish in real time so it's autonomously driving or swimming through the tank and so we can test how live fish react to different uh, robots that uh, yeah, behave in different ways. Yeah, the first prototypes uh, of this kind of uh, yeah, robofish, they were uh, produced in the UK. My, uh, my boss uh, had a uh, first idea on that and they tried it with a different species, with uh, the stickleback. And uh, they can't use this automatic or uh, integrated uh, behavior, but it was uh, the first uh, time they really started to use uh, these kind of dummy fish that were uh, driven by a robotic uh, unit to interact with live fish. And then, yeah, here in Berlin, um, my boss and I, we, we started in collaborating with uh, robotic engineers from the Free University to really build an even smaller uh, model of the robofish that is able to freely interact with uh, guppies, with mollies, with other tropical fish that are more easy to keep in a laboratory. And so, step by step, we uh, yeah, added things, we um, refined the appearance of the dummy. And yeah, for example, we, we first started by uh, painting the eyes on the dummy and the fish didn't react very well to that. So they didn't accept this kind of uh, dummy fish as a conspecific. And then the idea was to, to use uh, teddy bear glass eyes uh, to put on the dummy and that worked. So we can put this uh, dummy fish inside a, a normal aquarium and some of the males will start courting uh, this uh, dummy, so they really believe it's a conspecific. Yeah, it is for to, to investigate collective behavior and collective movement behavior. Normally, we, we can just observe huge groups or aggregates of uh, animals like uh, birds or fish, or some uh, yeah, zebra herds, but um, we can't really manipulate uh, the rules how these individuals interact. We have some ideas how these rules are, but we can't really test, because to test the rules, we have to manipulate what uh, the animals really do inside these uh, swarms, these groups, and with the robot, we can integrate an individual inside these groups, these swarms, and then manipulate the rules how the robot interacts with its neighbors. And so we can test which rules are really important, which rules are not so important, 
and which rules we may have missed in our um, theoretical considerations about how a swarm is uh, functioning. I mean, the idea to use um, artificial uh, animals is, uh, is old. So even in the beginning of uh, this field, the uh, ethology, the looking at uh, behavior of animals, people used uh, some artifacts or dummies to uh, stimulate uh, live animals. And with the even uh, better uh, robotic techniques at the moment, we saw that this is a perfect um, yeah, field where we can go in and uh, use these new kinds of um, electronics and techniques to, to really bring that field forward and integrate such a yeah, fish-like uh, robot into a live swarm. Whenever humans interact non-verbally, so whenever people um, yeah, meet and don't talk to each other, they use similar rules that we can find in these fish swarms, we can find in uh, yeah, flocking birds or in uh, other mammals in big uh, swarms, the same, very same rules, and they are based on the distances among the individuals. So one of these rules is to um, yeah, go wherever you see a neighbor individual. And when this neighboring individual is within an optimal zone around you, you align with it. Then you move into the same direction and when it's coming too close, you avoid uh, this individual by moving away from it. And these three simple rules by attracting, so swimming towards or moving towards the conspecific neighbor, then aligning with it when it's in the optimal uh, distance and avoiding it, so moving away from it when it's coming too close. These three simple rules, they also work with humans. That was uh, tested um, uh, also with uh, people uh, from our lab renting a, a big uh, gym and inviting many people to uh, participate and they were given these rules and uh, yeah, they really acted as a swarm and then we can also uh, yeah, introduce leaders into these uh, kind of uh, swarms by giving some individuals information where to move. And then when all the others follow these rules, so align with uh, the neighbors that are around me and follow them, then a leader that uh, moves to a certain uh, direction will keep all the others following him. I mean, we, we are in some situations that simple. Not in all situations, but in uh, many situations. For example, when you go to a stadium or do a, a music concert and you don't know your neighbors, you don't talk to them, but you follow where they walk. You follow where they move and then you apply very similar rules. So we all know this, uh, this minimum distance that we want to keep to others, uh, that it's not offending uh, to us. And this is very similar to the avoidance rules that uh, animals have in their swarms when others come too close. And this is, uh, yeah. So in fact, we, we use very similar distance-based rules for our interaction. And another um, thing that we can learn from these uh, swarm experiments here with the robot and the live fish is how information is spreading through uh, big swarms, big schools, big groups. And this is very similar than uh, when one fish, for example, um, yeah, sees a predator, recognizes that there is a predator. It will move away from that predator in a, a specific way, in a very fast way. So that indicates there is something and all the others react to that. So they don't see the predators themselves, but they have to react to the uh, behavior of the conspecific. And then this information that there is a predator will spread through the whole group. And we can see similar uh, things when we look at the social media, where uh, some tweets spread uh, in very short time around the globe. And it's the same rules that apply here. So the advantage of using uh, fish and small-sized fish is that we can have them in the laboratory at uh, high density. So we can really simulate their swarming behavior in the laboratory, which is not uh, possible when you uh, yeah, think about uh, birds or even larger mammals. You always have to go uh, into the wild and observe them, and then uh, your um, ability to manipulate them in a way that you can test several uh, of your hypotheses is very limited. So here we can uh, manipulate a lot, we can test a lot of theories, by still having them in their natural uh, density, in their natural group size.
which is not possible with bigger animals and with animals that need um, more specific um, habitats or care. Yeah, so the, the, the normal work life here is uh, basically that we decide uh, on, on the ideas that we want to test, on our hypothesis beforehand, and then we try to design experiments. So we ask what predictions do uh, uh, relate to that uh, hypothesis, and then uh, we try to design experiments that can specifically test these predictions. And then we look, okay, can we use the robot for that? or uh, do we have to observe live uh, groups, or do we have um, yeah, the right cameras, the right software to investigate the group behavior then. And when that is all decided, then we go and ask for the permissions to do the experiments, and then we start doing the experiments here in the lab. And it's, most often it's a, it's a, a bout of experimental work, then a bout of time that you spend analyzing uh, your videos, your uh, observations, your data, and then you see, okay, maybe that worked out uh, pretty well, then you try to, to publish that as a result, or you go back to the lab, which is the most uh, common procedure, and you refine something and then try it again. So to uh, always uh, have a continuous improvement of your uh, experiments that you then can really answer your question. This laboratory is part of the uh, Excellence Cluster Science of Intelligence, which is uh, located at the Technical University, the TU and the uh, Free University, and as well the Humboldt University. But we also cooperate with uh, the Leibniz Institute for Freshwater Ecology and Inland Fisheries. Yeah, so the limits with, with this kind of experiments is uh, for sure that we um, cannot create uh, really natural environment for them. As you see here, the tank is uh, yeah almost empty, so we can't uh, allow uh, the fish to interact with uh, a lot of structures here because the robot will yeah can't uh, really swim around them or uh, will collidate uh, with these structures. Then, so we have to have a very clean tank, and that is yeah for sure not uh, mirroring that what uh, the animals have in nature. So. That's why we always try to complement our research here in the lab, also with research in the wild. So we regularly go to, for example, South America, to Middle America, Central America, where these animals live, and observe them in the wild. We take big cameras with us, we observe their grouping behavior, and then we try to uh, connect both things. So here in the lab, we can get the mechanisms, how uh, something works, and then in the wild, we look, why do they do it? And how do they do it in a larger scale? And uh, this is something we, we also um, yeah, try to do in all the student work here, to have a, a, a laboratory uh, compartment or compon uh, component of the work and a field-based component of the work. The Excellence Cluster, Science of Intelligence, um, has the aim to understand intelligent behavior at many different um, levels of organization in animals, in humans, but also in artificial agents like drones or cars or uh, robotic swarms. And our idea is that one has to have always an analytic part where you analyze what you see and what you do and a synthetic part where you put your knowledge that you observed or that you got from your observations into uh, artificial uh, built agent. And the synthetic part and this analytic part there in all projects of the science uh, of intelligence cluster are merged. So we always have a component that involves building of synthetic agents like the robotic fish, and we have parts of analytic um, uh, base uh, on an analytic base that really analyzes what you see, what rules apply, and this uh, combination of the two parts, the synthetic side and the analytic side, that really makes this uh, cluster special and. We think that this is a good way to really get to know what is individual intelligence, what is social intelligence, and what is collective intelligence. Yeah, basically, when, when you want to design autonomous cars or drones that uh, fly on their own, you have to give them some rules how they should interact with their environment 
and with other drones or uh, with, with uh, humans I uh, experience in the environment. And exploring these rules uh, is very, uh, very hard if you don't have a base uh, line where to refer to. And that's how we can use our fish, our robotic fish. We can test rules that would apply also to autonomous cars here with the robot. And we can see whether these rules then really work in a uh, more or less um, real environment. Many things are simulated in the computer, how things should work in uh, these kind of uh, autonomous cars or drones, but you always have to go the uh, next step into the real world, because uh, there could be a, a real world gap, as it is called. So in the computer, everything works fine, but then, yeah, the computer don't have walls. The computer don't have any friction or uh, something like this. The computer don't have, uh, yeah, battery limits that, uh, yeah, may be not um, linear. And so you really have to try out your rules that you want to apply in a real world scenario. And that is how we can also use the robot. The, the advantage to do um, something like this in Berlin is that Berlin has so many universities and so many good researchers that are all um, located here in Berlin. So as I said before, this project is a, um, yeah, is a teamwork of researchers from the Technical University, from the Free University, from the Humboldt University, from several Leibniz Institutes. And uh, yeah, Berlin is a perfect place to have this kind of collaboration because there are so many scientists from so many different fields that you really can bring together them in, in one room and then talk together uh, to them, uh, talk with them, talk about ideas and then, yeah, bring these ideas uh, to the road, which the robot is a perfect example. I think my, yeah, my personal fascinating, uh, fascination uh, derives from very early uh, childhood experiences where I think a, an uncle of mine uh, yeah, gave me some fish. I don't remember the species in a, in a small bowl and I had them for a long time and then, yeah, as a, as a teenager, I had a lot of tanks in my, uh, my room and uh, yeah, I think my, my parents weren't so happy about that. But finally, yeah, it played out and I, I found a job uh, uh, really looking at fish. So um, yeah, in the end it paid off and I really uh, yeah, work or have fish. I'm fascinated by fish for yeah, since mostly uh, all of my life. <laughs>